Hello. I'm Risha, and I'm here to introduce our next presenters, and also to remind you to rate your talks on sked.com um, after each session. So this next talk is going to be about one of my favorite topics, cake. Just kidding. Uh, it's actually about a planned feature that sounds really cool, which is being able to update resource, pod resources without having to restart pods and containers. And here to speak to us about that is Carol and Beata. And Carol works on vertical pod auto-scaling at Google, and Beata works on horizontal pod scaling at Google. I wish I could scale anything diagonally, but I'm going to let them talk now. Please welcome Carol and Beta. All right, so just testing, can you hear me? I think so, yes, that's perfect. Uh, so just a very short correction. Uh, actually, both work on vertical pod auto scaling, but uh, uh, we also did some work, both of us did some work on horizontal pod auto scaling. Uh, we're both involved with the Kubernetes uh, autoscaling special interest group. Uh, so we would like to talk to you today about re resizing of running pods. Uh, and this topic involves a quite important limitation that exists currently in the Kubernetes ecosystem. And we would like to present to you the initiative in the community to actually overcome this limitation. So we're starting from the beginning. I think that's a good place to start. Uh, so you've probably all seen something like this. This is a very simple deployment. Um, and there is an important section uh, in that uh, deployment specification where you can say how much uh, resources your workload requests. And this sort of says how much, uh, how, how much CPU, how much memory your workload needs to run. So the problem is that this resource demand that you specify is static. You specify it once, and it's there for the whole workload's timeline. Time uh, so I think this doesn't really match the real life well. Uh, everything keeps changing over time. And with resources, this is due to uh, many reasons. So your app may have some periodic ups and downs that, uh, in the um, usage that affect the uh, resource demand, uh, it may get hugely popular, right? Your user uh, base uh, grows over time. So also over time, your resource consumption grows. Uh, also, what we've seen is that many applications uh, have varying resource needs depending on the life cycle phase that they are in. So one very common pattern is that during the initialization phase, uh, many apps tend to use more resources than later during their uh, regular operations. So the important question is, why should you care? Why do you care that over time, your resource requests and your real usage diverge? They're different. So to answer that, we'll take a quick recap of how Kubernetes scheduling works. Uh, to start with, the resource request is actually a contract. It's a contract between the Kubernetes scheduler and your workload. And what it says is that if you request a certain amount, for example, request a certain amount of CPU, the Kubernetes scheduler guarantees to reserve those resources in the cluster if they're available. Uh, so it will never put your workload on a node that has less resources available than, that, 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 than those that you requested. OK, so resource request is a contract, and contract is a very big word, so let's see how this works in practice. Uh, we have a simple situation in, in our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we have two nodes, and they're currently empty. They, have, but they both have 900 mini CPUs uh, space. Uh, and there are two pods, and they're just waiting to be scheduled. Uh, so one pod is requesting 250 mini-CPU, another one is requesting slightly more, 600 mini-CPU. So far, so good. This is simple, right? One pod go goes to one node, one pod goes to the other node. And let's say at this moment that we're still in a good place. The workloads use actually the amount of resources that they request. So workloads are happy. 
they have the, everything that should be running is running. The workloads have the resources that they need to run. But as we said in the, inter, in the inter, introduction, the things keep changing. So, oh, of course, your app is getting more popular, as I said before, and it has more work to do. So let's assume that one of the pods grew its usage, it doubled its usage. It's now using 500 mini CPUs, but it's still requesting the 250 mini CPUs that we set in the first place. So at the moment, this is not so bad. I mean, there's spare resources on the node, and it makes little sense for those CPU cycle to sit, cycles to sit idle. So what Kubernetes will do, it will give you those spare CPU cycles, and your workload will, will be able to burst. So this looks quite OK, but there is a, an inherent risk in this situation that we're going to uncover just in a moment. In the meantime, your application was busy, but you were busy as well. You have a new app that you want to launch. So you just finished, and you create a new pod with your new app. And, this is, uh, it, and it's requesting 600 mini CPU. So now the situation is a little bit more complicated, because according to your contract with the scheduler, you only need 250 mini CPUs from that first node. So there is 650 mini CPUs just waiting to be used. So what the scheduler will do, it will go ahead and it will schedule the pod on the first node, making your previous pod unhappy. It's, we already know that it needs more than it requests, so it will become throttled. And please note that we're talking about CPU, but uh, if we were uh, talking about memory, which is uh, not really, sorry, I think I missed one slide. That's where I wanted to say that the situation is worse. Uh, and the workflow is throttled. So uh, as I was saying, uh, we're talking about CPU. CPU is a bit easier because right, right, your workload is throttled. It will not perform as well as you would like, but it's still running. However, if this was memory, which is not compressible, uh, this would mean that your node would get memory pressure. And in this situation, Kubelet will actually start evicting pods. And uh, the mechanism is that it starts evicting pods uh, from the ones that are the most offensive, so the ones that use uh, more resources than they request. So now we know that we don't like out-of-day resource requests, right? They're risky. Like bad things can happen to your workloads, to your clusters. Uh, luckily for you, there is a thing that can keep them up to date for you. And this is the vertical pod autoscaler. Uh, what vertical pod autoscaler does, it, it does the thing that scheduler doesn't. It takes uh, into account your actual usage, not only resource requests. So it watches the usage, uh, and based on that, it recommends the resources that your workloads should be requesting. And optionally, if you configure it to do so, it can update those resources. But this is the tricky part. And this is matched by the experimental mark that you have here on the slide. Uh, and I will explain why that experimental is there in just a minute. So VPA basically can be configured to work in three different modes at the moment. It can be configured in an off mode, which is sort of a dry run. It gives you recommendations, but it will never change the requests of your running pods. Then we have the initial mode that updates the requests of the pods but only on pod creation. And the third one is the, it goes one step further, and it's the full thing. Uh, it will look at your pods, at your running pods, and it will update the resource requests if needed. So there is a, a graph showing in more detail how this all works. Mm, so there is, this, there is a dedicated VPA component called VPA Updater that takes care of this. And what it does, it uh, constantly watches the pods. It watches their resource requests. It also watches the recommendations that VPA produces for you based on the actual usage. And if those two things diverge too much, it will gradually evict the pods, let them be recreated by a deployment, and then apply the new uh, recommended settings. 
So I think you will agree that this seems a bit complicated for a simple resize, right? We have to evict the pod, recreate it, and only then we can apply new resources. So the problem is that the place where you specify your resource request, the pod spec, is currently immutable. So there is no way to modify resource requests of a running pod. And this problem does not only concern VPA. If you wanted to do this manually yourself, right, you create a patch where you want to update resource requests of your running pod, this patch will get rejected. It's actually not permitted in the Kubernetes. So this has very significant consequences both for VPA and for any other actors that want to resize pods. Um, for example, there are several types of workloads that it makes absolutely no sense to resize because the resize means a restart. Take, for example, a long-running bad job that has no way of snapshotting itself. Let's say it runs for two hours, and then you decide that it's using a slightly not good amount of resources. It should be requesting something else. Should you restart it and lose the two hours of work that is already done? or just wait and live with the fact that your resource requests are out of date. OK, so now that Bata stated the problem, uh, we'll try to solve it. Uh, just to recap, our problem is immutable pod spec. So while uh, we search the internet, there is this one weird trick that everyone applies uh, to make other people scared, and we will apply it too. So how to change? how to solve the problem of immutable pod spec? Well, the trick is really simple. We just make it mutable, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and this allows us to uh, in, uh, change the resources and then uh, uh, apply the changes uh, to the containers without restarting the pod. Uh, so it sounds really simple, uh, right? Uh, but yeah, life isn't always that simple, so there is a caveat, uh, that it's a breaking change. And that's actually the uh, most tricky part uh, of all this. And uh, that the change uh, that we want to introduce breaks uh, things. And just to be clear, uh, it's not about breaking the, or changing the API. It, it doesn't really matter how we change the APIs. Uh, what we break is the assumption uh, that the pod spec is immutable. Currently, there are many. Uh, there is a lot of code in Kubernetes which assumes that once you create a pod, the resources are immutable, and uh, yeah, that's, gonna, that's going to change. So uh, let's see exactly uh, what's affected. So we'll start with the um, container. Like uh, We all love containers here. So uh, in Kubernetes, uh, like in real life, the containers uh, are fixed size. And again, this assumption, as I said, is built in into many places including outside Kubernetes. So uh, let's have a look at the Java application. Uh, as you can see here uh, on the slide, uh, it requests uh, one gigabyte of memory. And uh, for quite a while, uh, Java has already support from containers. Uh, so uh, the JVM will automatically detect the amount of memory it has in the container it runs in, and it will apply these settings. Uh, so it will only use one gigabyte of memory. And actually, you don't even have to use the use container support flag. It's turned on by default. It's just shown here uh, for completeness. So it all looks nice. But the problem here is that this all, all this fine tuning uh, is happening only on JVM, restart, uh, JVM start. So let's consider two scenarios. Uh, on the picture, the gray area shows uh, the pot request, uh, and the blue one uh, shows what's used by JVM. And we only look at the height here. So we start with the perfect fit, right? Our Java application is using all the memory uh, that is available in the container. All looks fine. So now uh, let's imagine that we will grow the request uh, and the limit to, let's say, two gigabytes, uh, because, well, our usage grew. So what happens? Actually, nothing. Like, the container has more resources, uh, but the Java application is not aware of it, and it will just JVM will happily run with one gigabyte of memory, and the other one will appear only on your bill uh, from your cloud provider. And it's even worse uh, if we try to downscale. Uh, so if we downscale the container uh, below one gigabyte, JVM is, again, not aware uh, of the change, and it will 
all end up in tears or in out of memory event to be exact. And if you thought that the problems are limited only to like old school fixed size containers like Java, uh, then well, you definitely belong to the glasses half full group of people. So let's ha uh, have a closer look at what happens when we try to downscale the application. So on this picture, we have, uh, again, a container. And the uh, gray area represents the request. And the green represents uh, actual usage. And I guess you would like to lower uh, the uh, resource consumption, or the request, actually, uh, to just above the uh, green area. Well, first of all, to minimize the resource waste, but to keep some margin uh, in case there are some small spikes that happen before you can react and grow the uh, resource request again. But if we look closer, it's not as easy, uh, simply because the memory that is actually used is not what is actually reported by Kubelet. And this is due to the fact that uh, C Group's implementation is still not perfect. And then we have two possibilities. If we lower the request here, uh, everything is fine, uh, because your margin is big enough. But if you do it like here, then we have, again, an out-of-memory event. So with trying to take away memory from running applications, we have to be really careful. OK, so the assumption uh, about PodSpec being immutable, as you could see, uh, is, was present in a, a number of places, but that's not all. Uh, here we have a list of uh, major uh, Kubernetes components that have this assumption built into. So first of all, scheduler, uh, at the very least, uh, it would have to be updated uh, to be aware of the changes, so it doesn't schedule uh, new pods where there is no resources anymore uh, due to in-place updates. Um, but actually, for our change uh, to really work, the scheduler needs to uh, do more things, like maybe evicting lower priority pods before we apply uh, the change. The kubelet uh, is another place uh, where work needs to be done, and the major part here is actually uh, applying the changes to C groups because, well, they won't apply by themselves, right? And the quota controller, uh, the story here is uh, a little bit funny. Like, the quota controller is built with, a, with an assumption that the resources that the quota controls change over time. So you would expect that actually it should be really transparent and that change should be transparent and the quota controller should be ready uh, for our change. But there is like one line of code which checks that, well, if it's an update and if it's uh, for the pod, then of course nothing changed. So even in the component that should really be uh, up to date with uh, this, we need to change the code a little bit, but still. OK, so as you have seen, we have multiple components involved. And that also means uh, that there are multiple uh, special interest groups involved. So uh, making all this work uh, requires coordinations. Uh, and so uh, we have started a CAP, so Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal, uh, to coordinate all that change. But uh, before we have a look uh, inside, I would like to say a very big thank you to all the people who helped her, uh, in particular Vinay, who uh, drove the CAP uh, forward. And one more thing before we proceed, the cap is pending approval, so anything you hear is provisional and uh, might change. OK, so uh, let's start with the changes uh, in the pod object. Uh, they are all listed here. Uh, first of all, uh, part of pod spec, namely resource requirements, uh, will be made mutable. And from now on, they only uh, describe the desired state of our cluster, of our pod, or its containers. So it's no longer true that this field describes what the pod actually uh, has uh, reserved by Kubelet. Uh, the other field, uh, resource allocations, uh, is a technical field. Uh, it says what scheduler allows uh, the pod to have, <clears throat> so what scheduler vetted that the, this pod can use. And the third one, resource allocated, is the actual state that the Kubelet applied to the pod. 
So from now on, uh, all, if you want to look at the current state, only the uh, resource allocated <coughs> show the actual usage. And we have two new pod conditions uh, just to show uh, where the in-place update process uh, is. In, uh, is. Uh, so now let's try a more dynamic approach uh, to make things clear. Uh, so we have a very, very simple cluster. It has only one node and three pods. And we will try to trace a relatively happy path uh, of a resource increase for the blue pod, so the biggest one. Okay, so it all starts with our happy user, which submits a patch to increase the resources. The patch goes to API server, which does all the validation like it normally does. Uh, that includes RBAC check. Uh, and once that's done, uh, the admission controllers are called. Uh, and here, uh, in particular, a quota controller is called. And to avoid any gamification of the system, the quota controller has to look at the maximum of the desired and actual state. So you cannot try to game the system. And that's in line with how quota controller works today, right? Because you use up quota before the pot is actually scheduled. So you might end up in a situation when you requ uh, require re uh, requested resources and use up the quota, but the pot is not running uh, currently, and that will stay. OK, so let's assume that all admissions controllers were fine. And so what happens, uh, API server uh, stores the state in etcd. So we have now uh, an updated pod object. And uh, at this point, the scheduler observes the change uh, via its normal watch and will try to act on it. And uh, in our example, uh, let's assume that uh, there is not enough space on the node to grow the blue pod. So uh, what will happen? Uh, luckily for us, the yellow one had a very low priority, uh, so scheduler could evict it. So it will simply do that. And once that's done, uh, the scheduler will update the etcd uh, with its vetted state. And from now on, the kubelet takes on. Again, it watches the pod spec uh, via watch. Uh, and uh, once the uh, change is vetted by scheduler, uh, kubelet can apply uh, new settings to the C group. And from now on, our uh, blue pot is much bigger, even if it doesn't show on the picture. OK, um, we have also some uh, knobs uh, for those of you who like knobs and uh, tuning the systems. Uh, so first of all, uh, there is uh, the resize policy knob. It says what should happen uh, to the container uh, when we apply the input, uh, in place uh, request update. Uh, the default option is no restart. It's designed for all these new uh, containers that can handle uh, resources dynamically. Uh, so we assume that it really be the default behavior uh, of the containers, uh, at least at some point. Restart container option is designed for the old school containers, like our JVM example, and it means that to apply new resources, you restart the container, but you don't restart the pod. So the pod stays uh, where it was, and only the single container uh, is restarted. And restart pod basically means that in-place update is not supported by this pod, that you have to reschedule it. So it means that it will be evicted and rescheduled from scratch with new resources. So that's for applications that maybe require some init container to be rerun uh, on updated uh, resources. And we have another knob, uh, which is retry policy. This one is on pod level. So it only describes what happens if the in-place update couldn't uh, be completed successfully. Uh, first option, no retry, means that, well, as it's, uh, you could expect that it's the end state. So the actor that required the change will have to clean up uh, the state of the cluster, whether it will be by reverting the change uh, or changing uh, the resources or maybe doing something else completely, I don't know, evicting that very precious job, that's fine. It can be either uh, our user or human operator. It can be an automated actor like vertical pod autoscaler. Retry update uh, is a usual uh, retry and con control loop 
uh, from the uh, Kubernetes, so it will periodically retry uh, to apply the change uh, that you requested. Uh, if it succeeds, fine. If not, well, we are not in a hurry. Like all retry loops in Kubernetes, it will run indefinitely. And reschedule means uh, that the pod will be recreated. So it's more or less like restart pod, but only for the failure scenarios. All right, so now we come to the part that everybody was waiting for, so the cake. Uh, we don't have actual cake, but uh, why this is both having and eating the cake. We can have the best of two words. On one hand, we can minimize the disruptions that we need to do to the pods to keep them updated, because no, we no longer require a pod restart to apply the new settings. On the other hand, we can have the better stability that we've seen comes from the fact that our resource requests are up to date with our actual usage. So for vertical pod autoscaler, this solution means that we can introduce new update modes. Um, one is in place only, and the, another one is in place preferred. And don't get to attached to names. They will probably change. Naming is hard. Uh, but they basically give the idea about what we intend to do. So uh, the in-place only mode uh, is for the workloads that we know can't tolerate restarts due to resource, due to resizes. So the example I gave before, we have a long running bad, jobs, bad job that it makes no sense to restart during its lifetime. In that mode, we will guarantee that if we want to resize the pod, it will only be done if it's, it's possible to do it in place. Uh, in place preferred uh, will mean that we will first try an in place update. And only if that fails, we will resort to restarting the pod to apply new settings. We believe that this can then become the new auto mode, the new default, because this is what most, uh, what we see that most applications can tolerate. We minimize the disruption, but if it's really needed, we can actually restart the pod to apply the settings. Also, uh, just to note, if you're interested to hear more about vertical pod autoscaler itself, uh, tomorrow at 5 to 4, there is a Seek Autoscaling deep dive where you can hear all about all the autoscaler, autoscalers, including the vertical pod autoscaler. So I really encourage you to go. And now for the cap that Carol mentioned, uh, if you want even more details on the in-place updates, uh, or you have feedback that you, or you would like to comment, uh, please uh, review the, uh, the cap. And also feel free to uh, get in touch with us with any feedback or comments that you have. And last but not least, definitely not least, uh, I would like to mention all the people involved in this proposal, in this uh, initiative. It's really a lot of people. It's a lot of reviewers. It's a lot of contributors. Uh, and everyone who is involved, like your involvement really is invaluable. This is an important and big change. Um, and I would really like to use this uh, place to say a huge thank you to everyone involved. And uh, this concludes our presentation. Thank you very much for listening. And this is the time for questions. Thank you.